the use of marijuana. You know, they, they would consider a, a gateway drug. Well, the, the the quality of marijuana in the you know, year 2000 is significantly different than it was in the 60s and 70s, and whatever they mix with it, and um, how easy it is for people to now even just get addicted to the use of uh, of pills seems to be doesn't take very much. Mm -hmm. you know, where someone may be addicted to marijuana in the old days was a more of a prolonged use of the drug over a period of time, where mm -hmm. the use of pills, and I'm not the doctor, you are, but to me, just from what the little I've exposure I've had in working with people as a legislator is it, it doesn't take much at all mm -hmm. for someone to end up down the wrong path. Right. Yeah, the cycle, the cycle to dependence with opiates is much more rapid than it is with marijuana or alcohol, for example. Um, and so the, 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 the intensity of the euphoria is very seductive, and that's one of the issues, is that that intensity and the pleasant effects that people like makes you want to repeat it, makes you want to go and get some more, and then people find themselves, that drug gets its, gets its hooks into your brain, and then before you know it, you can be quite quickly beca become dependent. Now, uh, someone, now, someone like Lynn, you, you see you know, people, uh, I'm sure, working with the mayor, and you know, I, I get calls and I get alarmed when I see it about, you know, geez, my son, my daughter has a problem. I assume working with the mayor, you see a lot of that. You know, it's we do. Um, Mayor Kay, actually, when she came into office, um, she has like an open door policy with constituents and um, people were coming to her and talking about the severity of the issue um, with opiate drugs in Weymouth. And um, so that's when she, we have a substance abuse prevention team as part of our youth coalition. So I work in the health department, so she asked me to come upstairs and, and talk. and, and um, and we had been working on addressing the issues of opiates, but she actually brought it more public um, to the community. And in, in, in Weymouth, what we're really working on is, is um, getting families help, um, getting them uh, resources for treatment, and, um, and trying to educate them, trying to educate families on how to protect loved ones um, from future use. Uh, and, uh, and even when you see that, I mean, you see kids my heart goes out to some of the, you know, I have younger brothers and sisters who still have teenagers, and mm -hmm. I also think one of the things that has changed significantly, I have a few years on, on most of you, and that is uh, the choices that we had at, at, and we were, when I was much younger, and my parents would probably agree when they were much younger, they, they didn't appear to be as complicated as they are today for, for people growing up in the society. And the availability just to which the speed of, of information passes also means that access mm -hmm. to certain information is made you know, much quicker and available. And I assume that helps move drugs also in society too, whether mm -hmm. it be through cell phones or other use. But even in schools, I mean, how do you, how do you really know that someone, if someone said to me, gee, I suspect that one of my kids may have a problem, what, what do you look for? Well, I think the beauty of being one of the nurses in the school is that you have the availability to bridge the gap between the parent and the student because like we're talking here right now and the parents talk to each other and the students talk to each other. It's getting the parents and the child to communicate and as the nurse in the building, as nurses in all of the schools everywhere, we can facilitate that conversation. If the parent suspects something, we can bring the kid in and talk to them, see what, you know, do an assessment, see if there's anything that we see. If the student wants to share with us, we can help bridge that gap and help the parent and the student communicate about the problem and where to go from there. Now, obviously, hopefully some parents uh, find it easy to talk to kids and others. And my, my father was a teacher in the Quincy schools and in his day, we used to say he knew more about drugs and alcohol than we did, and just because he was, in those days, younger and uh, in his younger days, and that that uh, taught at the vocational school, and so he was most helpful until my brothers and sisters and I, and talking about risk. But other parents, you know, may find that more difficult or not understand the ability to do that. So there are places, even Dr. Kelly, other places that that uh, you know, where, where can people get resources or information about, you know, how do you discuss this with your kids or, you know, places to go? Um. Well, there are a lot of resources online uh, mm -hmm. from the federal government and state uh, governments as well. Uh, but particularly if you go to SAMHSA, mm -hmm. uh, S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov, um, there's resources through CSAP, which is the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. 
uh, and there's resources on those websites, federal websites, tons of free resources that you can get sent to your home for free. Um, they have stuff for parents to fo focus on parents on what to do. Um, and what's, what, what are the warning signs to look for, how to begin an ongoing conversation with your child about alcohol and drugs. Um, so there are lots and lots of uh, free resources out there. It's just knowing that they're there and going to those websites to get them. Uh, in your capacity, are you, out, are you training people to help spread the word? Is that one of the things that you do at, at, uh, as a professor? You know, the courses that you're teaching now, are you teaching people how to have parents talk to their kids and well, whenever I give talks on, on, on topics like this, uh, one of the major components is, is identification. So how do you know when your kid is, is uh, maybe using drugs, alcohol and drugs, um, to so detect the it early? alcohol tends to be easy. So you used to smell it. You know, and that, and uh, you, mm -hmm. you know you were a goner in those days. And marijuana, I'd probably easy. You could probably smell it as well. But you know, there was someone is using uh, one of the, the opiates or taking pills. That yeah. That gets to be a little bit harder, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it does, and uh, uh, because the effects aren't as obvious, like you say, uh, you can't. The smell, smell usually. I mean, yeah. then, uh, I can remember my mother taking everybody the smell test, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yeah, right. and uh, so th that they just and uh, no, no one chewed gum. So if anyone was ever chewing gum, she was all already on them, and, yeah. and it just it was hard to put one over, and, and uh, you know that. I was I was 18 when the drinking age was 18, and obviously they've raised it because for a variety of reasons. I think they recognized that that was probably at the time a mistake, and um, the people, as much as they were going off to war, that they, they demonstrated the increased deaths and highway deaths and the abuse yeah. issue was probably the binge drinking and others became an issue. But I get more worried that that there appears to well there are problems still that people have to deal with, and the, the district attorney's office does a lot of community education on. Uh, alcohol use and and binge drinking and and uh, trying to to um, set things straight. It, it's still um, the the use of uh, opiates is something that I it just it kind of scares me in the sense that uh, the number of people that that it is affected it just uh, boggles my mind. Well, one of the things now is I mean they raised the drinking age to prevent those alcohol. It was it was mainly automobile accidents that wanted and that halved right. managed to half the rates of automobile deaths through raising the drinking age. But what's it very interesting about and disturbing now about the opiate crisis is that uh, opiate deaths now is the second leading cause of death in this country, only beaten out by automobile accidents. That's the only thing that's actually greater than, greater than heart than disease yeah. or uh, yeah, it's the leading cause of leading death. Leading cause of death. Um, it's the second, oh. second leading cause of death after after automobile oh, accident, and it's the first leading cause of death in 16 states. No, currently the, uh, out of 50. No, I guess call me a simpleton in, in some respects. What, what is troubling to me is that if, uh, if we had a disease, and we worked very hard in this country to obviously fight the, uh, the AIDS epidemic and to develop drugs and treatment and, and uh, safeguards and protocols and the tuberculosis scare that they had and the polio scare. I was, you know, I'm of that age where even a couple of my friends were polio victims. And so, you know, we fought hard to eradicate what we consider to be, you know, threats to society, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things for, for I'm having a hard time, and one of the reasons why I guess you all are here tonight with me is that this is one of the few ways that we can help bring the word to people that this really is a fight, and you know, when you you talk about the statistics as to you know, are we one is our opiate use, are we one of the 16 states in Massachusetts? Are uh, the leading cause of injury death in Massachusetts? Right, right.